listening to Dallas Theological Seminary's Chapel Podcast. I'm pleased to introduce our president, Dr. Mark Bailey, as our chapel speaker today. Dr. Bailey came to DTS in 1985 as professor in Bible exposition. In 1997, he was appointed vice president for academic affairs and academic dean. And in 2001, he was named the fifth president of Dallas Seminary. Mark has been actively involved in pastoral ministry and theological education for 35 years, and he's conducted many tours to Israel, the Middle East, and Europe, and has authored several books and articles. Dr. Bailey and his wife, Barbara, have two sons, Josh, who's married to Emily, and Jeremy, and they especially enjoy their two grandchildren. I would like you to join with me in welcoming our president, Dr. Mark Bailey, as he comes to speak. to add my word of welcome to our new students and our new faculty members. Uh, it is a delight to uh, see you. I spent this last week in uh, cold Florida, uh, below freezing temperatures, uh, with uh, about 25 to 30 evangelical presidents and their wives as we meet together once a year uh, for prayer, uh, for inspiration, instruction. And uh, so on behalf of that group, I also welcome you to DTS. Uh, they have a high regard for us. Uh, they respect you for being here, and we have a great camaraderie, and it was a uh, terrific time to be uh, with them. Uh, but the uh, hoarseness in my throat is uh, blamed on uh, unseasonable weather in Florida. Uh, but uh, you can pray for those folks there because uh, their crops are dependent upon temperatures uh, that are a little different than what uh, uh, they've experienced these last 12 days. Uh, our motto in our seal that is above me here in the chapel is preach the word. Uh, our mission statement is Dallas Theological Seminary exists to glorify God by equipping godly servant leaders for the proclamation of his word in the building up of the body of Christ worldwide. In our Dallas Seminary catalog, uh, after our mission statement is uh, stated, we have an expanded statement of purpose. And I want you to hear one of those purposes. Uh, Dallas Theological Seminary is committed to its founding ideal that the central subject of study is the entire Bible. Dallas Seminary stands unequivocally committed to the Bible as God's inerrant, infallible, and authoritative written revelation. Members of the school's boards and uh, the faculty subscribe to the seminary's doctrinal statement which is uniquely complete and detailed, and thus helping safeguard the school's unwavering theological stance since its founding. A second bullet under that purpose is that the seminary's commitment to the scriptures leads to a framework of doctrine in which the great fundamentals of the Christian faith are affirmed and expounded. The doctrines of evangelical orthodoxy are taught in the framework of premillennial dispensational theology uh, derived from a consistent grammatical historical uh, interpretation of the Bible. Those truths include such essentials as the authority and inerrancy of the scriptures, the Trinity, uh, the full deity and humanity of Christ, the spiritual lostness of the human race, the, the spiritual lostness of the human race, the substitutionary atonement and bodily resurrection of Christ, salvation by faith alone in Christ alone and the physical return of Christ. Uh, those have been commitments since our founding. And I want to uh, take a thread of uh, the scriptures this morning in a little bit different way than I have ever done in a, a beginning chapel like this. And I want to talk about the thread of uh, dispensational expressions of worship. Uh, before I do, uh, however, I want to acknowledge uh, a milestone on our faculty in the history of Dallas Theological Seminary, of uh, 85, now 86 years, uh, one has been with us who has been teaching for 60 years uh, as we celebrate that milestone today as he walked into the classroom. Uh, would you join me in thanking Prof. Howard Hendricks for 60 years of faithful teaching at DPS?
It's been the privilege of my life over the last 25 years that I have been here to uh, team teach with him a course on hermeneutics and uh, Bible study methods in which we uh, have a, a brief hour or so to, uh, to talk about this grand theme of the scriptures. I, I want you to think in four, yea, five periods of time, four on earth and one yet to be experienced in heaven in which worship takes place. Uh, during the lifetimes of the patriarchs, almost anyone, uh, anywhere, at any time, uh, brought their sacrifice, built a memorial, and worshiped God at a, any location they found themselves. Abel, for example, in Genesis 4-4, on his part, uh, brought the firstlings of his flock and the fat portions, and the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. In Genesis 8:20, it says, Noah built an altar to the Lord and took of every clean animal and every, every clean bird and offered burnt offerings on the altar. In Genesis 12, 8, Abraham proceeded from there to the mountain, it says, on, on east of Bethel, and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. In Genesis 13, 18, uh, then Abraham moved his tent and came and dwelt by the, the oaks of Mamre, uh, which are in Hebron. And, and there he built an altar to the Lord. Uh, in the north, in the central section. And, and then uh, it says in Genesis twenty two fourteen, where he had offered Isaac on the altar and God kept him from slaying him uh, to reveal to himself, uh, to, to Abram, excuse me, himself, that God himself would provide. It says he called the name of the place uh, Yahweh Yairah, uh, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. Uh, speaking of Mount Moriah later, obviously, uh, Jerusalem. In Genesis 26, 25, Isaac built an altar and, and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent. Uh, and, and there Isaac's servants dug a well. This is all the way down at the southern extent of the land at, at Beersheba. In Genesis 28, we have a section in verses 18 to 22. Let me read it. So Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on its top. He called the name of the place Bethel. However, previously the name of the city had been Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take, and will give me food to eat and garments to wear, and I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. This stone, which I have set up as a pillar, will be God's house, and all, of all that you give me, he says to the Lord, I will surely give a tenth to you. A time, a, a place, an offerer, and the sacrifice are identified. Later in Jacob's life, he offered a sacrifice on the mountain called Mizpah. And he called his kinsmen to the meal, and they ate the meal and spent the night on the mountain. Later in Jacob's life, in chapter 33, verse 20 of Genesis, uh, there he, Jacob, erected at Shechem an altar and, and called it El Elohe Israel. In chapter 35, verse 7, Jacob built an altar there and called the name of the place El Bethel, because there God had re revealed himself to him when he had fled from his brother. In these early years of the patriarchs, uh, uh, almost anyone uh, with the patriarchs highlighted, obviously, uh, anywhere they were, where God had made himself known to them, uh, they built an altar, they worshipped God. Even Job, who's the writing of which probably took place later, the story of which took place uh, probably in patriarchal times, for it says in 1.5 of Job, when the days of feasting had completed their cycle... Job would send and consecrate them, uh, rising up early in the morning and offering burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For he said, perhaps my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did continually. Uh, anyone, anywhere, at any time could offer a sacrifice. Uh, even before the law was given in Exodus, uh, God told Moses, he said, you shall say it is the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptian, but he spared our homes. And it was there that the people bowed low and worshiped. In Exodus 17, Moses built an altar 
and named it, The Lord is My Banner. And in Exodus 20, the instruction comes, You shall make an altar of earth for me, and you shall sacrifice on it your burnt offerings, your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I cause my name to be remembered, I will come to you and bless you. Interesting enough, in chapter 24, verse 4, Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. And then he arose early in the morning and he built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. In the pre-law period of the scriptures, the record that we have, we have occasional and incidental references, though very important references, uh, to worship. But before God gave that instruction that he would designate a place, where sacrifice should be made. As far as time is concerned, there were no stipulated times of worship. As, as far as places, those who worshiped offered sacrifices on the altars they built in different places where God had made himself known to them. As far as the priests or the ones offering, it seems that it was most often the father or the head of the clan who acted on behalf of his household. Uh, Genesis 8, Genesis 22 and as we saw in Job chapter 1 and verse 5. From the sacrifices that are offered, the few instances that we see suggest that the primary emphasis was on an individual a relationship to God. Uh, we find that early in Genesis and, and throughout the book. And, and besides the offering of sacrifices, worship in this particular period was especially characterized by expression of thanks to God, especially for the promises of God. So pre-law, anyone, anytime, anywhere, could offer a sacrifice, build an altar, consecrate themselves, consecrate that place, even rename the place to reflect the way God had worked in their lives. But when God gave Moses the law and gave Israel the law through Moses, mediated by angels, the, the scriptures tell us, under law, worship was much more minutely prescribed and regulated. The times were Sabbaths and specially convened feasts or festivals. And although there was no specified time given for the five offerings in and of themselves, Israel was given a calendar of special feasts, including Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, Day of Atonement, and tabernacles. That's outlined in Leviticus chapter 23, where the succession is revealed that the first three, Passover, Unleavened bread and the first fruits all fell within days of one another in the month of Nisan. That's not a car, it's a month, one S. <laughs> Nisan was the first month of the Jewish religious year. The cycle began with Passover, which was observed on the evening of the 14th day of Nisan. Unleavened bread was celebrated on the 15th. The first fruits were offered on the day after the Sabbath that followed the Passover. Then 50 days were counted from first fruits to celebrate the Feasts of Weeks, as it was called, or Pentecost. It fell in the month of Sivan, uh, trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and tabernacles, closed out the national religious celebrations in the month of Tishri, or October. From Rosh Hashanah, trumpets, to the close of, Sukkot, uh, or the close of tabernacles, excuse me, spanned a period of 22 days. Over the years, extra-biblical commemorations are also placed on the Jewish calendar. Uh, one is uh, Hanukkah, or the Feast of Dedication that the book of John talks about, and the other is the Feast of Purim, which became famous with the story with Esther in the book of Esther, or the Feast of Lots. And those two are the most noteworthy feasts beyond the Levitical feasts. But three of these special feasts were mandatory for all Israelite males. Exodus chapter, excuse me, Deuteronomy chapter 16, 16 and 17 says, Three times a year shall all thy males appear before the Lord thy God in the place he shall choose. In the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and in the Feast of Weeks, and in the Feast of Tabernacles, they shall not appear before the Lord empty. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he has given thee. Bound up in this command are two major elements. In these three feasts, all males were to appear before the Lord. And number two, every man was to bring what he was able to give according to the proportionate blessing of God upon his life. Uh, those were the times. Uh, uh, Sabbaths, 
uh, of festivals uh, marked by a lunar calendar, uh, counted off from the, the day of Passover, which began the religious calendar for the people of Israel. As God had said to Moses, uh, this will be the first day of the first month of, uh, in essence, the rest of your life, so to speak. The place of sacrifice and worship was centralized under the law. First in the temple during the wilderness wanderings and in the earliest days uh, in the land, and later in the temple at Jerusalem. Uh, grab your Bible and turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 12 for a moment. And you may want to just jot passages down as we uh, just sort of uh, string some uh, beads on a, on a thread of this theme of worship across uh, the eras. Deuteronomy chapter 12. Let's pick it up in verse 5. Under the laws of the sanctuary, but you shall seek the Lord at the place which the Lord your God will choose from all your tribes to establish his name there for his dwelling, and there you shall come. Look down at verse 11. Then it shall come about that the place in which the Lord your God will choose for his name to dwell, that you should bring what I command you, etc. Verse 13. Be careful that you do not offer your burnt offerings in every cultic place you see. But in the place where God chooses in one of your tribes, there you shall offer your burnt offerings, and there you shall do all that I command you. Verse 18. But you shall eat them before the Lord your God in the place where the Lord your God will choose. Verse 21. If the place which the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far from you, uh, then you have... Uh, exceptional practice as it relates there. Verse 26, only your holy things, uh, which you may have, and your votive offerings, you shall take and go to the place which the Lord chooses. The place was centralized. It was centralized around the tabernacle during the wilderness wanderings. I call it a porto temple. And later it was uh, uh, made permanent in the land of Israel, obviously at the threshing floor of Aruna there on uh, Mount Moriah. Uh, turn back with me to Exodus chapter 25. Why did God specify such a place? Well, God had in mind a particular function for this gathering place for worship. Exodus chapter 25. Notice it talks about again in verse 8, the place where God would dwell with them. He says, let them consecrate, or excuse me, construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. That was the place where God physically and visibly manifested himself uh, with the Shekinah glory in the Holy of Holies, the holiest part of that sanctuary. Uh, not only did God choose to dwell with them there, but look down at verse 22 in Exodus 25. It is the place where God would meet them. And in Exodus 25, 22, again, it says the place where God would speak to them. God would dwell among them. God would meet with them, and God would speak to them. Listen to it. There I will meet with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony. I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. The times were designated. The place was restricted. The priesthood was established. The Levitical priesthood. Only those from the tribe of Levi could function as priests. And only those uh, with Aaron and from the, the family of Aaron would be designated as priests who could offer sacrifices. That's found in Exodus 28, 1 and Exodus 40, verse 15. Listen to 40, 15. And you shall anoint them even as you have anointed their father. So it's Aaron and his sons that they may minister as priests, notice this, to me. Notice the direction of the worship. It's not priests toward the people, but it's priests to me. And their anointing will qualify them for a perpetual priesthood uh, throughout their generations. Only Aaron, as the high priest at this time, could enter the holy place, the holiest place of the tabernacle. And that was only one day of year, Yom Kippur, the day of atonement according to Leviticus chapter 16. The, the times were regulated, the, the place was designated, the, the priests were, were authenticated, the sacrifices were detailed. In addition to the daily sacrifices offered mornings and evenings according to Exodus 29, 
there were specified offerings, five of them, the burnt, the meal, the peace, the sin, and the trespass offerings that are outlined and detailed in minute detail in Leviticus chapters 1 through 7. What we learned from this period of time, it was that at no time except appointed times, at no place except the central sanctuary, by no one except qualified Levitical priests and the Aaronic priesthood, specified sacrifices, the how, the what, the how much, the when, all of it is minutely revealed. There was a time that anybody, anywhere, at any time could offer a sacrifice, build an offering, and worship God. Then there was a period of time in which the place, the time, the priests and the sacrifices were specifically and with great detail instructed. So much so that you remember a little of the story. After the conquest of the land in the book of Joshua, the two and a half tribes on the east side of the Jordan River uh, were ready to build an altar and worship God on the border between the two as they were going back to their side of the river. And that almost starts a civil war within Israel because God had given at no place except at the central sanctuary, at no place except where God had designated, at no other times than those that God had specified, by no one else than those that God had anointed and appointed. Under law, in that great period of time where God had revealed his will for the people of Israel uh, through Moses by means of the mediating angels, God had said, this is what it should look like. Uh, the worship theme is just one single thread that could be uh, uh, spun into a whole cloth and a fabric of everything else that was involved with that. But when we come to the present age, on this side of the cross, something drastically changed. When there is a change of dispensation, some things get added. For example, Galatians says that the law was added uh, after 430 years to the promise It did not nullify the promise that was given before, but the law was added because of transgression. Uh, Sometimes things stop. For example, uh, the need for circumcision or the need for uh, a Sabbath. Uh, When we come to the New Testament, every day is holy to the Lord. Each man will give an account to the Lord. And uh, the, 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 the diet, uh, uh, the dietary restrictions, thus Jesus declared all foods clean, uh, one of the gospel writers tells us. Some things stop in terms of their need to be uh, demonstrated. Uh, But some things change. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 12 says this. With the changing of the priesthood, there came also the necessity of the changing of the law. With the changing of the priesthood came also the necessity of the changing of the law. The revelation that God was given for how to regulate uh, life and worship in this period of time was drastically changing. That's probably best illustrated in in a tucked away passage uh, uh, that describes the events at uh, the well at Sychar with the woman of Samaria, John chapter 4. Turn there with me for a moment. It's a fascinating announcement that Jesus the Messiah makes as he has uh, revealed himself in Jerusalem uh, at the temple by cleansing the temple. Uh, by uh, his conversation with Nicodemus. Uh, An up-and-outer who is a Jew needs Jesus. That's Nicodemus. But a down-and-outer, the Samaritan woman, also needed Jesus. And it's in the middle of that conversation when she decides to to throw a dodgeball at Jesus, when she uh, tries to trump him, "Our, our fathers worshiped on this mountain, verse 20. And you people, nice slang expression, talking about the Jews, you people say, Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, notice how he does not dodge truth while he reveals what's coming next. Woman, believe me, an hour is coming, there's your time, when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem, there's the place, will you worship the Father Now, he doesn't cut her any slack. You worship what you don't know. We worship what we do know. For whether or not you like it, salvation is of the Jews. For us who are Gentiles, we have to abide by that. 
Salvation comes to the most unlikely people from the most unlikely source in all of God's dealings with humanity. Salvation comes through the Jews. But an hour is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He was called the Christ. And when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Uh, you and I live at a great time for worship. It's not confined to a mountain in Judea. It, it's obviously not confined to a mountain, Mount Gerizim, in the Samaritan region. John refers to a different time, an hour is coming and now is. And that's a phrase in John's gospel that speaks of the, the ministry of Christ through his passionate suffering and death by which Jesus will make a, a way of approach available to the Father God. We live at a, a great time for worship. We could do it anywhere at any time. Neither at Gerizim nor in Jerusalem, place is no longer a help, nor is it a hindrance. But what about the priest? Turn with me to that passage. I quoted the first part of it, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 12. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 12. It says, for, for when the priesthood is changed, uh, of necessity there takes place the change of the law also. For the one, speaking of Jesus Christ, concerning whom these things are spoken, belongs to another tribe. Now watch this statement. It captures all of the history of the Old Testament as far as what was and what was not appropriate. He belongs to another tribe from which no one has officiated at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord was descended from Judah, the tribe with reference to which Moses spoke nothing concerning priests. Verse 15, and this is clearer still if another priest arises according to the likeness of Melchizedek who has become such not on the basis of a law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. For it is attested of him, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Jesus Christ could not have been our high priest under law. The law had to change, and the law had to change because in the providence of God and the plan of God, the priesthood changed. And so we have uh, no specified place. We have uh, uh, an opportune time. In fact, it's that same book uh, that, that, that invites us to come boldly uh, to a throne of grace wherein we can find help and mercy just in time whenever we need it. Because Jesus is God's anointed means of access to the Father. In this age, there is no human intermediary between men and God Rather, every believer is a priest, according to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 and 9. And Jesus Christ is the great high priest through whom we come into the presence of God. 1 Timothy 2, 5 says, For there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Listen to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. And coming to him is to a living stone which is rejected by men, but is choice and precious in the sight of God. You also as living stones, that's your biblical last name, Livingston. You also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. Watch this, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The time, the place, the priesthood is all changed. And so are the kinds of sacrifices the New Testament describes at least four kinds of sacrifices that you and I make out of the recognition that all that we are and all that we have belongs to God. We first of all give him ourselves, Romans 12, 1. And 2 Corinthians 8, 4, where Paul is uh, extolling the Macedonian example where he said they first gave of themselves and then of their means. Hebrews 13, 15, and 16 describe to others the fruit of praise. And, and, and the, the, the efforts of good works are all offerings that we give to God. And Philippians 4.18 talks about what we give in, 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 in missionary support and in church support. Uh, our giving 
is a sacrifice that is acceptable to God. Uh, the Bible speaks of, uh, of ourselves, our praise, our works, and our giving. All are the ways that we offer spiritual sacrifices that will be acceptable to God, but they're mediated through our great high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, there is a fourth period of time that the scriptures describe. As far as time, the normal or, or, regular, or, or uh, uh, literal reading of the plans for worship in the earthly kingdom during what we now know from the New Testament will be a millennium or a length of a thousand-year reign of Christ reveals a vision for worship unlike anything that has ever come before. Uh, some of the feast will also be observed according to Ezekiel chapter 45. The place will be Jerusalem again. And ironically, the, the temple will be the center of worship with Christ reigning as king and priest. In fact, turn back with me to Zechariah chapter 6 in that final uh, vision uh, that concludes the first part of Zechariah. We have a ceremony of, of uh, coronation of, uh, of Joshua the high priest as a symbol of what is to come. And in Zechariah, that's in the small books of your Old Testament, as someone once said, in the white portion of your Bible, mostly unused, but terrific material. Let's look at Zechariah chapter 6, verse 11. He says, take the silver and the gold, make an ornate crown and set it over the head of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Now, this is unusual to have a crown rather than a turban on a priest. And then say to him, thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold a man whose name is Branch, for he will branch out from where he is, and he will build the temple of the Lord. Yes, it is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he who will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. Now, since 586 B.C., with the destruction of the temple, this has never happened. And so we expect it in the future. He will build the temple of the Lord. He will bear the honor and sit and rule on his throne. Now watch this. Thus he will be a priest on his throne. And the council of peace will be between both offices, two offices. There's coming a time uh, in Jerusalem, on planet Earth, in the future, where Messiah, the king priest, will have both offices between his feet, so to speak. He will be a priest and a king on a throne in Jerusalem. That's what the scriptures reveal. And uh, worship will be centered around the magnificent temple described by Ezekiel. Uh, this is not the same uh, exact structure as the uh, physical temple of Solomon's day. This won't be in heaven. We know it's not in heaven because Revelation tells us there will be no temple there. So there has to be a time for a temple described by Ezekiel sometime between its destruction in 586 B.C. and eternity. The priest in the millennial kingdom, will, will, there will be a restoration of the Levitical priesthood on one side, but with the unfaithful line of the priest replaced by the single faithful line called the sons of Zadok. So it wasn't just any of the sons of Levi. It was of the family of Zadok. That comes back out of the history of Zadok and Abiathar were priests under David. 2 Samuel 20, verse 25, supported him during Absalom's revolt, according to 2 Samuel 15. And in the succession struggle after David's death, Zadok supported Solomon, while Abiathar supported Adonijah. And Zadok therefore anointed Solomon and became his sole priest. And it was because of that loyalty that God said, that's whom I'm going to use in the future. The sacrifices are reinstituted. That bothers some people. But Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 to 4 help us when it says this, that the sacrifices of the Old Testament never took away sin. They were not expiatory. That They didn't cleanse the conscience. They, they couldn't remove the guilt. Only the death of Jesus Christ can do that. Therefore, if the Levitical sacrifices in, under law didn't substitute for sin, didn't satisfy sin, didn't take away sin, memorial sacrifices from the millennium won't either. 
We believe that those will be memorial. As the first were anticipatory, these will be memorial. Besides that, you have a good example in the book of Acts of believing Jews who were still offering sacrifices at the temple even though they had come to faith in the only one who could satisfy their sin need, Jesus. So if I have, for example, uh, if I have uh, sacrifices, Jesus the Messiah, the king priest being officiating in leadership, those sacrifices might be the best-smelling barbecue you've ever smelled in your life as a sweet-smelling savor of memorial. It won't be restricted just to the nation of Israel, but will include all the nations, as Zechariah 14 tells us. In short, worship in the millennium will be similar to, and I would expect it to have a Jewish flavor, because we believe in a future for the nation of Israel with a center of kingdom on planet Earth being Jerusalem, with a Jewish priesthood, I would expect it to be very Jewish in its orientation. But the furniture is different, the sacrifices are a bit different, uh, all of the dimensions are different, the, the, the allotment in the land is entirely different. The prince and the priest function on the same territory of the Temple Mount, that couldn't have happened before. What a great day on planet Earth we anticipate. Anytime, anywhere, by anybody, at no time except appointed times, by nobody except appointed priests with specified sacrifices, where we can come boldly to the throne of grace because we have someone at the right hand of God interceding for us, we have any time, anywhere, at any time, you and I can come as believer priests through our high priests in worship and sacrifice. But what will be totally different is one day, one day all of that which the sacrifices and the festivals anticipated will be fulfilled visibly and physically. First on planet Earth, in a millennial kingdom, and ultimately that will give way when there's no need for a temple because the Lord God will dwell among his people and he will be the temple. So I told you there's four periods. Yay, let me give you one more. And that's what will heaven look like. And we only have glimpses. But in time, it'll be for an eternity. Unequaled opportunity for ceaseless and unrestrained worship. No specified times of worship are given to us, but rather one continual time of praise and adoration to our God. Romans, excuse me, Revelation 4 and seven. One notable exception, however, is that we're told, as we mentioned, that there is no longer any temple. Revelation 21, 22 says, I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. Its priests are a kingdom of priests from every tribe. Don't miss that. From every tribe, tongue, nation, and people. John Piper says, missions exist because worship doesn't, like it ought to all over the world. Sacrifices, no longer be offerings of sacrifices at a physical temple, but rather the constant expressions of praise to God. Worship will be conducted in the presence of God before the throne. Here all the symbols and all the types are cast aside in the presence of him who is the realization of all that they anticipated. Here worship centers forever on God and his son, Jesus Christ, by the power and strength of his spirit. What I love especially as we close about Revelation 4 and 5 is that the angels, and I've said this in class on numerous occasions, but the angels who've been with him from the beginning, when we get there, will still be so overcome by their adoration of him that they set the tone of worship. They set the tone of adoration they set the tone with myriads of myriads and thousands and thousands, like, like a mighty thunder of worship to our God. And Ephesians 2.7 2, says this, that God will take eternity to explain to us how great the love is with which he loved us. And it'll be then and then only when we can love him because he first loved us. Would you pray with me? Father, this is just a thread that we've sought to trace of how worship has changed according to your direction, your particular emphasis at a particular period of time, all moving in one direction, 
culminating ultimately around your throne in the heavenly Jerusalem with a new heaven and a new earth, focused in worship toward the one who is only worthy of worship, and that is you, our God. May we live our lives in anticipation of that and a reflection of that to the best of our ability and dependence upon you while we still seek through glass darkly. But one day we'll know as we are known and what great worship will be. Our experience in your direction then. We dedicate ourselves this semester to that heartbeat. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.